Mark chapter 4 and verse 1, and he began again to teach by the seaside. That sounds kind of nice right now. I wouldn't mind teaching by the seaside. Maybe we'll have a summer cookout at Compesca in our Wednesday night service out there or something. He began to teach again by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground. And did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some an hundred. And he said unto them in verse nine, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. With your attention tonight, I'd like to teach on this topic. Making a disciple requires work. Now, last week we read from this same portion of Scripture, and we talked about being a disciple. And being a disciple absolutely requires work. It requires effort of you. Now, it is not optional. It is the Great Commission. We are to be disciples. We are to make disciples. We are to go into all of the world to teach and to preach this wonderful gospel that we are so privileged to know and to hold. But it is not an option. And Jesus would have us to know that being and making a disciple will take work on our part. Proverbs chapter two and verse one, as we read last week, Solomon writes and says, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hidden treasures, Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If you were not here last week, those five verses remind us, those five verses instruct us and let us see and understand that being a disciple is anything but a passive endeavor. It is anything but something that just happens to us by osmosis. We don't just merely come to church and 20 years down the road, all of a sudden we're automatically a disciple. Being a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ is something that will require diligent effort on our part. If you seek her as silver, if you search for her as a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. The New Testament puts it this way, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Being a disciple will require you to invest diligently in the soil of your heart. Now, the ground, as we talked last week, is your responsibility. The seed is not the problem. The seed is never the problem because the word of God is pure. It is perfect. The the law of the Lord, Psalm 19 and verse 7 reads, is, is perfect, converting the soul. So the ground is our responsibility. And the Lord is gracious enough to provide us insight, to help us to see and to understand. In moments where the seed needs to get into the soil of our life, he'll help us to see areas that are wayside. He'll help us to recognize thorns in the ground of our life, he will help us to recognize uh, stones. He has also provided us with spiritual leadership to help us with this insight. The Lord might show you a stone. The Lord might show you a thorn or a thistle. 
Your pastor or a, another minister might show you. Your, your brother or your sister in the church might receive a word from the Lord with insight into the condition of your soil. But it is ultimately your responsibility. Being a disciple will require us to suffer at times. Jesus says that we are to take up our cross and to follow him. It's not a very great sales pitch if you're merely trying to increase your band of followers. It's, it's not the way that you win friends and influence people. Except in the spiritual ground of the kingdom, it is the only way to win people. It is the only way for us to lead people closer to Jesus Christ. We are to follow as they follow Christ. There is an art to being a successful follower. Everything may rise and fall on leadership, but there is absolutely an art to being a good follower. There's, there's skill that is required to follow successfully. And as a good and successful and faithful follower, you can elevate your leadership to the next level by your followership. You're not a disciple if you refuse to be led. In Exodus chapter 18 and verse 25, and we begin to wrap up our review here. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people. Rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons, the hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged himself. Why are we taking the time to dive into this? Why are we taking the time to revisit something that's been a perpetual theme of the Jesus Church for years? To, to be a disciple and to make a disciple. Because where God is taking his kingdom in South Dakota will require people to grow. It will require people, everybody under the sound of my voice, to be equipped to be a ruler of ten. Or to be a ruler of 50, to be a ruler of 100, to be a ruler of 1,000. Now, you might sit here tonight with the capacity to lead 50. And for that, I applaud you and I say thank God for the abilities and the talents that he has blessed you with. But why would we settle with the ability to lead 50 if the ability to lead 1,000 is out there? Maybe God wants to grow your capacity. Maybe God wants to plant something else deep down inside of you and begin to elevate you and begin to multiply you and multiply your effectiveness. I believe somebody with the capacity to lead a thousand people is in this room right now. Now, it's work, but it's worth it. And others will probably see the growth in you before you do. In your pursuit of God, in your hunger to get close to God, when you're diligently focusing on being a disciple, it is, it, it is probable that somebody from the outside will begin to notice the changes and notice the maturation and notice the depth that's being added to your spirit before you do. In our opening text, Jesus is teaching a great multitude of potential disciples. Many people have gathered in very close. And so to avoid being crushed by the crowd and avoid the crowd just clamoring to reach him because he, he wants to impart to them some spiritual wisdom, he gets on a boat and from the boat he teaches the crowd gathered on the shore. And we read in Mark chapter 4, as he finishes his teaching in verse 35, it says the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when he had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full and he was in the hinder part of a ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? So here's Jesus. He has just finished a marathon 
lakeside teaching project. And he's asked his disciples to get a boat and to take them to the other side of the river. And in the middle of a massive storm where seasoned fishermen begin to fear for their lives, Jesus is asleep on a pillow. Why is Jesus asleep on a pillow? Yes, I understand. He's the Prince of Peace. He has all foreknowledge. He has all wisdom. He has all understanding. And so he's able to sleep in a storm. That's a great sermon. You could preach that. You can begin to believe that. And I believe that was an element of that. He was the creator. He knew full well all he had to do was speak and the storm would stop. And so that allowed him to go to sleep. But I submit to you tonight that Jesus was also tired. Because making a disciple is going to take work and it's going to take effort and it's going to consume physical human energy of which we have a finite, limited amount. uh, And Jesus, the greatest disciple maker that ever lived, had spent the entire day pouring into a multitude and pouring into his disciples. uh, And now the flesh of Jesus Christ was simply exhausted and sleeping on a pillow. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he says to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you don't have any faith? And they feared exceedingly and said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Ministering to an individual or to a group, it takes time, it takes energy, and it takes virtue. You're human. I I mean, at least I think all of us are. You get tired. And that's not a bad thing. Has anybody in here ever been tired before? I got four hands. The rest of you are amazing. Talk to me. Okay, somebody's raising two hands. Got it. Now, anybody tired right now? All right. There we go. There we go. Yes, I will freely and fully admit to you right now, I am tired. That is part and parcel of the human condition. We have a finite level of energy and there are things we can do to conserve or to increase or to expend that energy. But I ask you tonight, why are you tired Because if we're constantly tired because of career and because of entertainment and not because of kingdom causes, then we need to reassess the way in which we're expending our energy. Now, there's there's something different about being tired from going to church or being tired from a long day at work. There's just a different energy expenditure that's happening, but we arrive at the same state. It's not wrong to be tired. I want to encourage somebody tonight. You are not wrong to be fatigued. You're not wrong when you're tired. You are human. You are flesh. And it's going to happen. But you and I have to realize we cannot constantly be on. We cannot constantly have the switch flip to the on position and run at 110 miles an hour. And I'm absolutely talking to myself and preaching to myself tonight. You you cannot function at 100 percent capacity for an unlimited amount of time. You must begin to deal with the fatigue. In Mark chapter one and verse 32, Mark captures Jesus in his gospel in such a human way more so perhaps than any of the other gospel writers. And we, we understand that they're writing from different perspectives and different focuses, but Mark seems to capture the humanity of Jesus Christ so well. It says that even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils, and all of the city was gathered together at the door. It's evening time. Jesus has probably had a long day. He's looking forward to sitting down to a meal of some freshly roasted lamb, a little bit of bread, some oil and some herbs. But now all of the sudden the entire community shows up at his door. 
And the Bible says he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. But verse 35 holds the key, I believe, to success or continued success in making disciples. In the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there He prayed. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, understood. He realized that this flesh does indeed need time to tap the brakes, withdraw from the multitude, step into a solitary place where we can be alone with the King of kings and the Lord of lords and begin to pray. It is the way that you recharge. It is the way that you plug in. It is the way that you tap in to a life giving source, withdraw, find solitude and find connection with the king. Withdraw, get away from the crowd for a moment and allow God to begin to pour into your life and renew and restore virtue in you. The work of the kingdom will require you to be diligent about investing in yourself. To be a disciple is going to require energy on your part, but to turn around and begin to make disciples will require energy. And so the only answer and the only recourse we have is to lean heavily upon the rest of the Holy Ghost. To lean heavily upon the love of Jesus Christ and learn how to withdraw into his presence and be renewed by him. As Isaiah wrote, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings uh, like eagles. There is something about uh, withdrawing faithfully and daily into God's presence and into a quiet place and into a solitary place that will recharge your batteries. Disciples take work. Newborns are intense. Any amens in the house? They get fed when they demand it. They make messes. That continues for a while. But if the newborn baby is to survive, it requires that the mother give a piece of herself and minister to this child to bring them along until they're at a place to function independently. It is no different in the church and we cannot as the mother church ever reach a place where we're so comfortable listening to the cry of the newborn and cleaning up the mess of the newborn, but never investing ourselves into those uh, that have come. Now, a couple of chapters later, the master disciple maker has sent his disciples out to preach to teach, to heal, and to make disciples. In Mark chapter 6, he commissions his 12 12 of his disciples and commissions them to be apostles, and he sends them two by two into cities and into different areas. Now, this is long before Pentecost has ever happened. These men have never yet been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They've never been baptized in Jesus' name. They still had much to learn in walking with Jesus, but perhaps We do too, because Jesus was willing to send early. He was willing to send people that you and I might not have thought most qualified or most prepared or most ready, but he was willing. He saw something inside of these 12 and he said, you know what? You can go and you can begin to spend and you can invest. He sent disciples early and it's it's highly likely that All of these disciples were in their late teens and early 20s at this point in time. And we read in Mark chapter 6 and verse 30 that the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus. And they're excited to tell the master about everything that they had done and everything that they had taught. You can picture the scene as Jesus is in that solitary place and they begin to filter back to him. And you've got Andrew and John running up to Jesus saying, Jesus, uh, you'll never believe what happened to us in Capernaum. And here comes Matthew and here comes uh, Peter. And they're telling him, Jesus, Jesus, this is this is what we did. 
And he said unto them in verse 31, come ye yourselves apart into the desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. It was the first recorded minister's retreat. The ministers were literally retreating. They're getting into a ship. They're withdrawing from the crowd. Jesus recognized in the eyes of his apostles. He recognized in the eyes of his disciples a fatigue with ministry that was setting in. He took a look at the surrounding and realized it was not going to sustain them for a period of time. And so he said, you know what? We're going to pull out for a moment. We're going to withdraw and we're going to invest back into ourselves. I'm on it a little bit heavy tonight, I understand, but I want to help somebody to know that making a disciple is going to cost you. And perhaps you've been holding back because you're scared of the cost. You're scared of the investment. You're scared of what it's going to require of yourself. But when we learn how to refresh ourselves in Jesus Christ, when we learn how and when to withdraw from the crowd and allow God to minister to us, then we can minister to others without fear of running out, without fear of exhausting ourselves. And the people saw them departing. And many knew him and ran afoot thither out of all cities and outwent them and came together unto him. The new babies were hungry. The people that Jesus had been working with, they were hungry. They were desiring something from him. You, you try turning your back on a hungry child sometime. I've got a, a kid currently that has more understanding than she has vocabulary. And she knows she's hungry. She knows what food item she wants, but she does not have words to express it. And so it all comes out as. Bah! And so we can put her in a high chair, but if we turn our back on her without providing her the thing, then she just. Bah! And you can only deal with so much of that. Before it begins to wear on you. And Jesus now. He's trying to pull his disciples into a place of rest, but along the shore they can see a multitude running with them. And so he's moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. It's a place that you and I need to be frequently. When is the last time that you were moved with compassion by the plight of the people around you? When's the last time that the heart of a disciple maker began to beat in your chest and your own agenda, your own desire, your own schedule was allowed to be pushed to the side to minister to the need of somebody in front of you that was hungry? When's the last time that you just closed down the phone and ignored the pile of laundry or perhaps ignored, ignored the dusting that needed to be done or the car that needed to be clean or the lawn that needed to be mowed because there was a need in front of you and compassion began to move in your heart. The day is far spent now and Jesus spends hours instructing these people and his disciples are tired, but Jesus has already learned the principle of withdrawing in the solitary place in the morning. And so now he's ministering to the crowd and his disciples come to him as the day is far spent. And they say, this is a desert place. The day is passed away. Get them out of here. Now, there it sounds like they're trying to be nice. They're like, just get them out of here. They got to go find something to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find something to eat. They're looking for something to eat. They're tired. They're weary. They're saying, Jesus, send them somewhere else. And he answers and says unto them in verse 37, you give them something to eat. There's nothing when you're tired and frustrated and weary, like being the one that has to get up and provide for somebody else that's tired and frustrated and weary. 
Surely any parent in the house knows exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody that's ever cared for a younger sibling, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And here's Jesus looking at his bedraggled apostles that have just come back from a long missionary trip and they're trying to go on a minister's retreat. Now here's Jesus pouring out his heart to a crowd and he has the gall and the audacity to turn to them and say, why don't you give them some food? And they're like, Jesus, I'm exhausted. I've got nothing left. And they say unto him, what, are we going to go buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them something to eat? There's a multi-level master class going on here. Jesus has been teaching the multitude of disciples, and he's been teaching his 12 closest disciples at the same time. He's, he's teaching the, the multitude, the crowd, he's teaching them base level things in the kingdom of God. He's, he's pouring out spiritual milk, but he's, he's trying to provide an example and some insight to the twelve that were closest to him. So he says unto them, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they said five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make them all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. It was done decently and it was done in order. You see, there is a time and a place for the structured, programmed block of instruction within the development of a disciple. There, There is a time and a place for a orderly purpose-driven discipleship class or course. You teach 100 people differently than you teach 5,000. You teach 10 people differently than you teach 100 people. You teach and you impact one person differently than you teach 10. And that's why God wants to elevate, to grow, and to raise up people that are able to effectively address a crowd of a thousand and begin to work with a crowd of a thousand. But I believe that everybody that's ever been born again in the kingdom has the capacity to work with one. You have the ability to work with one soul, and you have the ability to work one on one. So when he takes the five loaves, the two fishes, he looks into heaven, he blessed and he break the loaves, gave them to his disciples to set before them. The two fishes they they he divided among them all. They all did eat and were filled and they took up the 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. When man did what man could do, God did what only God could do. God did not need them to make them sit down, but he asked them to divide, to be orderly, to bring structure, to bring an element into it of humanity. And once man obeyed, and once man did what man was asked to do, God did what only God can do. If we will but do what God has asked us to do, go, teach, preach, and baptize, then God will do what only God can do. God uh, will pour out His Spirit. God will partner with us. And when we do the work, God will work with us and through us. In verse 44, it goes on, He said, They that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. There's a lot of numbers in this chapter. There's two fish. There's five loaves. There's groups of 50, there's groups of 100, there's groups of 5,000. Same thing we see in the book of Acts. There's 3,000 added to the church, 5,000 added to the church. Then seven deacons are added to the structure of the church. And all of a sudden, it begins to multiply exponentially. And a great company of the priests are obedient to the faith. Because there is a structured, administrative portion of large-scale discipleship. Now, don't misinterpret me here, though. The personal relationship is the foundational key. As Brother Stan Gleason says, if you can make a friend, you can make a disciple. Everybody in this room that has a friend has the capacity to lead somebody closer to Jesus Christ. It all starts with your personal relationship. You you must invite them into your life. Now, the culture today is a little bit different than the culture was in Jesus' time. It would be looked on a little bit differently if, if, if a guy had 12 other guys following him around and they just wandered around South Dakota going from town to town. That, that 
culture is a little bit different. There was already a rabbi disciple culture ship that or a culture that was that was there in that time frame and that perspective. But whatever it looks like, it looks a little bit different now, but it's still going to require you to have a high level of personal interaction with whomever you're working with. This isn't something you just get to do for 20 minutes on a Thursday or for five minute tag in on a Sunday. Raising up a discipleship requires a large investment of time from you. But as a church, we must also work together to properly administer the harvest. Because again, you disciple a hundred differently than you disciple one. Communication structure will be required. Pastor will need an update here or there. It's, it's just good stewardship about what's going on. He's, he's not looking over your shoulder. He's not trying to be a jerk. But the leader of 10 in Moses' time answered to somebody above to the leader of 50. And the leader of 50 answered to the leader of 100. All the way back to Moses. All the way up to God. Of course we take attendance in church. Of course we count people. Of course we want to know who's being taught a Bible study. And we want to know who's coming through exploring God's word. Or who's developing in this area. Or who's moving here. Yes, we're watching those things. We're tracking them. We want to know them. Would, would you come to this church if, if, if you knew that this church never counted the offerings? Didn't account for the tithes? Didn't have every cent and every dime that was ever given or spent out of this church tract, that would cause some major concern, would it not? If you knew somehow that every dollar you gave into the church, and by the way, every single penny is tracked, it is accounted, it is logged, it is known where it has gone, and it's known uh, where it came from. But how much more valuable are people than the U.S. dollar? Of course, we're going to build administrative structure to facilitate the influx of disciples, to facilitate the influx of people that are going to come because people are more valuable than the dollar. And of course, we account for the dollar, not just because the government requires us to. It's good stewardship of the things that God has placed in our hand uh, and people are far more vital. I'm here to tell you tonight, church, as the influx is coming and we've seen numbers begin to grow and to swell, we are going to have to work together like never before to administer that level of discipleship to 100 uh, or to administer that level of discipleship to 50. God, uh, if he were to drop 50 new babies in this place today, uh, you and I would have a major task ahead of us to disciple, to raise up, to prepare, to bring to maturity 50 new babies. I've raised three babies or mostly raised. I've started to raise three babies. And I, for the life of me, cannot fathom how somebody handles twins. I, I can't. Anybody? There's no twins in here, right? Twin. OK, but you were the twin. OK, I can't fathom how somebody raises twins. I, I just I don't understand it. Can you imagine you're changing this one and you're trying to get this one dressed and that one over there now needs change. And so you go do that. And then by the time you're done, you're back over here. But God will grow us and God will help us if we will work together, if we'll communicate together, if we will begin to uh, uh, bring this in hand in hand, in arm in arm. God will allow this church together with structure and with organization to administer the harvest of a hundred a whole lot differently than a one-on-one -on -one Bible study across the dining room table. I hope I'm communicating that clearly. I, I need that level of feedback from you. I, it's not because I, I have a knowledge gap and I, I just want to know everything. I need to know who you're working with. I need to know the updates. I, 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 I need those things so that we can work together. What if I find out a week from now that six people in the church are all investing all of their energy into the same person, but nobody's told anybody about it? This person could just be a giant virtue sucker that's enjoying all of this attention from six people in the church, and they're just soaking it in like, yes, this is awesome. Everybody pay attention to me. 
That would be a, a, a mistake because there are other people that need one-on-one attention and need one-on-one investment. And it's going to take work from every single one of us. And if we work together, God will help us to bring in the harvest he's promised. And straightway he constrained his disciples in verse 45. To get into the ship and go to the other side before Bethsaida, rather, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. We're back to it. The period of ministry is over. Jesus has ministered out of the excess he has. And the disciples are now, again, separated from the crowd. And Jesus withdraws from all to pray. And when the evening was come... The ship was in the midst of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing. For the wind was contrary to them, and at about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. The master was still teaching. There are some storms you will just have to watch your disciple go through for a while if faith and maturity is going to be formed in them. Parents, your kids are just going to get a few bruises in life. We've we've accepted that. We've settled that. We've we've all seen the helicopter parent that's there with the Band-Aid and the antiseptic spray. The moment that little Johnny gets a little scrape on his knee, helicopter mom is there. And little Johnny's knee now has a fresh Paw Patrol Band-Aid and some antiseptic spray. And she gets him a juice box the moment something goes wrong. We cannot do that as a disciple maker. There are periods of time. Jesus demonstrates this to us. uh, Now, this is not how you treat a newborn. You don't abandon the newborn to the Sea of Galilee and say, good luck, little Johnny. Go ahead. Run amok. Have fun. See you later. But these disciples are at a different level. And we've got to have the wisdom. We've got to have the knowledge from God. We've got to have the insight to know when and how to deal with the people we're working with. This is only going to come through experience. And it's only going to come through wisdom from the Lord. You ought to be asking God, God, what can I do? How can I work with this individual that you've been entrusting to my care? How can I invest in them? How can I grow them? But there are just some things you'll just have to watch them go through for a while if faith and maturity is ever going to develop inside of them. When they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a spirit. They cried out and they saw him and they're troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, be of good cheer it is I, be not afraid. See, it's the benefit of being a disciple. It seems like when they show up, the storm just stops. I don't know if you've ever been somewhere before and somebody that was in leadership in your life, you're in the middle of chaos and trouble and all of a sudden they step into the room. Now we're not elevating a man or a woman beyond, but we are giving honor where honor is due. There's just something about when your leader steps into the room. All of the chaos seems to diminish because the one that's been working with you now is there and you can look to them for answers and you can look to them for wisdom. I'm thankful for the impact that various men of God have had upon my life. I'm thankful for the answers and the moments and the the questions that I can take to them when the storm is beating upon my life. So he gets up into the ship. The wind ceased. They're sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and they wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Just one chapter prior, these disciples were sent out with the authority over demons and disease. But now they're being put through the storm. They had hearts that were hardened and they missed a moment of ministry because they could not be moved with compassion. You don't ever move beyond being teachable. You don't ever move beyond uh, being able to receive instruction. You never graduate in the school of God's kingdom. You, You never reach a place where nobody is able to lead or instruct you or guide you. 
It doesn't matter how many demons you've cast out or how many sick you've seen healed or how many you've been uh, prayed for that have been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You are always, always needing somebody to take you by the hand and lead you closer to Jesus Christ. It takes work to make a disciple. I hope I haven't beaten that horse completely to death. And I hope that's, that that point has made it through to somebody's heart today. But I want to shift gears a little bit. And I want to leave on a high note tonight. It absolutely will require effort, energy, sweat, tears, and possibly even blood to make a disciple. Just like raising a child is an incredible amount of energy expenditure, there is, however... An awesome return on the investment. Because if you raise that child right, there's such a treasure that's in your hands. In John chapter 4, we see again Jesus, as he must needs go through Samaria, the Bible says, he finds himself at a well in Samaria. The disciples now have gone in to the city to buy meat. They're serving their master and they they're into the city to buy meat. The woman comes to the well to draw and Jesus initiates conversation with her and begins to preach to her and to teach her. And she is the very first person that Jesus fully reveals and says, I, the one that speak to you, I am the Messiah that was prophesied from the Old Testament. And this woman is now she's blown away and God has spoken truth into her life. There's been this close one on one time of discipleship and she runs back into the city and his disciples have been watching and they've shown back up with the meat that they were sent to get. And they in verse 31, they say, Master, it's time to eat. And Jesus says to them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And the disciples say one to another, did, did, somebody, did somebody else bring him something? Like, did, did somebody stop by and give him some beef jerky or something while we were in Samaria? Where, where did this food come from? Did he have a Twinkie stuffed in a fold of his robe? Or he just had some stash somewhere that we didn't know about? And Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish His work. Say not ye there are four months and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Herein that saying is true. One soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you are entered into their labors. I'm here to tell somebody tonight. There is a rest. There is a refreshing that comes only when we're doing the will of him that has sent us. There is a meat that perhaps you do not know of yet. uh, And that meat is to get up uh, even when we're tired and we're weary in the body. uh, We can be refreshed and renewed in the spirit uh, by the action of investing into someone else. By the action of pouring into somebody else and seeing the transformation going on in their life. It will provide you a stirring. It will provide you a refreshing of virtue that nothing else can provide. Uh, And it does not matter. You might be the one that sowed. uh, You might be the one that planted. uh, But you might be the one that reaped. uh, But there is a return that comes to you when you've invested yourself and you've poured the sweat and the energy into bringing the harvest in. uh, Suddenly there is a meat inside of you that you do not know about. Uh, I can look around this room on any given day uh, and I can see people whose lives uh, they've impacted mine uh, and I can see people whose lives I'm impacted uh, and I'm telling you it does something to your heart uh, when you see somebody that you've been teaching uh, and you see somebody that you've been investing in uh, go down in the waters of baptism and come back out uh, it just stirs something inside of you you can go on that meet for a long time uh, when you see somebody that you taught a Bible study to 
to uh, come to the altar and lift their hands uh, and tears begin to stream down their face uh, and you see them be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You might not even be the one that prayed them through, uh, but there's a refreshing that comes from that. Uh, There's an encouragement that comes from that. There's a virtue uh, that comes back to you through that. Uh, Oh, your flesh is weary, uh, just like Jesus was weary by the well, uh, but there was something inside of his heart. His disciples did not yet understand it. Uh, Jesus was simply fulfilling the will of God. Uh, And if we'll just fulfill the will of the master for Watertown and for all of South Dakota, I'm here to tell you there is a virtue that will flow back to you. Uh, There is a strength that will flow back to you. Uh, There is an encouragement that will flow back into your life. John chapter 16 and verse 21. Jesus said, a woman when she is in travail hath sorrow because the hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. I tell you the moment that that disciple you've been laboring over for two years or for a year or for a month or for 10 years, the moment that they're born into the kingdom of God, uh, you're going to forget all of the anguish. You're going to forget all of the pain. You're going to forget all of the nights where you cried and you prayed and you asked God to keep working in their heart. You're going to forget all of the Bible studies that you studied for and sometimes they didn't even bother to show up. You're going to forget all of that the moment that you see your disciple begin to step into the kingdom of God. John chapter or third John chapter one and verse four, as we stand together, says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. There's nothing like making disciples. There's nothing like raising children in the natural and there is nothing that mirrors it in the spiritual It's an entirely full body, full energy exercise. You're pouring everything you have into it. But there's nothing like watching your child walk in the truth. John's not just talking about his children by blood. He's talking about men and women that he had invested years and days and hours of labor into. uh, And now he's watching them walk. Making a disciple is... Absolutely hard work. But it's a labor of love. There will be hard days. There will be days where you want to pull your hair out. What's going on back here? That's what I'm going to claim anyways. Can't, can't possibly be genetics. There will be days... When you just don't get it, you don't understand, and you want to throw, up, throw your hands up and throw in the towel. But if you just stick it out, if you just stay with it, if you just keep investing, if you just keep pouring into it, that moment will come where they will obey the gospel, and there will be the sweetest day of your relationship together. It will sustain you like nothing else can sustain you. If if you've never experienced it, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. But I want you to know what I'm talking about. If this sounds foreign to you, you you need to experience this. That somebody you discipled, somebody you worked with uh, is now being used to disciple somebody else. Or somebody you worked with gets born again. Or somebody you worked with is now teaching a Bible study. I'm telling you, it is it's 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 addicting. To start to work with somebody, to invest in somebody and see God begin to grow them and elevate them and raise them. Like a mother giving birth to a child. You seem to forget all of the bad and be encouraged by the good. There will be hard times along the way, but there'll also be memories along the way. I think back over the last couple of years of my life. I don't hold myself up as the greatest disciple maker of all time by any stretch, by any imagination. I tr- I'm trying. I want to make disciples. 
I'm being intentional about it as, as intentional as I can. I'm, I'm trying to be intentional as well to disciple my wife and disciple my children, to raise my family first and foremost. I can think back to just moments of Bible study around this church or moments. I, I think back to a moment where I was teaching a Bible study at the old rickety picnic table outside the church. It was finally a warm day that we had, and we decided to have a Bible study outside the church. And when that Bible study wrapped up, I thought I had flubbed it and dropped it. And somebody with tears coming on their cheeks and tears in their eyes say, you know, that's, that's one of the best Bible studies I've ever had. I can go in that meet for days. I can feed on that for a long time. I'm feeding on it right now because I'm looking back to that moment where I thought in my humanity I had messed it up, uh, but it wasn't messed up because I was working hand in hand with the Lord uh, and there was virtue that came back. I'm telling you, there's nothing like watching people you've discipled get married uh, and raise their children. And there's nothing like watching people you've discipled begin to be used in ministry. Oh, if I could just impart something to your heart today, it would be a desire to birth spiritual children into the kingdom of God. It's going to cost you, uh, but the cost is worth it. Uh, it's going to, to it's going to torment you. It's going to bring uh, about stress, and it's going to bring about pain, and it's going to bring about uh, anguish at night, and it's going to bring about sleepless nights. Uh, you're going to be moved with compassion over and over again. Uh, but oh, for the joy that a child is born! Uh, all of that is forgotten just to hold them uh, in your arms. Let's lift our hands in this place together. Uh,